Hi, I'm Jose Valim, and today is the second day of Livebooks Launch Week, and we are going to talk about distributed machine learning notebooks with Elixir and Livebook. So let's get started. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to start a new notebook, and one of the most important features in Livebook is the concept of smart cells. So smart cells, they are interactive widgets uh, for automating workflows. So for example, we can use them to create charts, to uh, send Slack messages, connect to the database. And one of the smart cells that we have, they are about neural network tasks. So if I click on that smart cell, it's going to say, look, you need those packages for this smart cell to run. And then the first time you run it, it's going to fetch the dependencies. You'll be able to find all the dependencies here and it's going to install them. And uh, we announced the neural network uh, smart cell a couple of releases ago. And this release has several new tasks. So for example, we can do one of the ones that are new here is like question answering. So we can generate this task. It's going to build a model for us and a form to interact with this model. So in question answering, you have a question, you have the context, and then you run it and it's going to give you an answer. Uh, another new one, new task that we have here is conversation, right? So you can choose the task, you can choose uh, the model. So now I'm going to try a medium model. The first time we run it, it's going to download the model. Then I execute it. It's going to once again set up a new app and then I can ask, uh, you know, what is love? And this one, because on the machine I'm recording, I only have a CPU, it's not running on the GPU. So the answer is going to take a while to come back, but I'm expecting it's going to be, baby, don't hurt me. And yep, there you go. So we have like several new tasks added as part of this release. And the one I think most people are going to excited about is the support for Whisper using the speech to text uh, task. So let's do that. Let's render this and I can submit an audio. Hello darkness, my old friend. And let's run this. And there you go, right? So the first time that we run the model, we are going to compile it. So if I run it again now with the same input, it's you can see it's slightly faster, right? So that's it. We have a bunch of new models uh, here for you to explore. And one of the things about smart cells, perhaps the coolest part about smart cells, is that at the end of the day, they are just code. And we can actually go and see this code and explore the code and change it in any way you want. So for example, hey, if you want to get this code, like this machine learning model and run it as part of your Phoenix app, you can easily go like copy the relevant parts, put in your application and deploy it. And this is something uh, Chris McCord, the creator of Phoenix has done recently. I'm going to share the video in the description below. And yeah, you can go, you can change it. So here I'm just looking at the code but we can even convert the smart cell to a cold cell altogether. And then we even get more flexibility on how we want to go and change it. And that's exactly what we are going to do for the second part of this video. In the second part of this video, we are going to understand what is the issue with the code as is right now. It has one limitation. So we are going to improve this code to make it concurrent and then to make it distributed. So let's do it. So here's the code that was generated by the smart cell. And the first part, it loads the model, it load, loads the featureizer, tokenizer, and everything from Hugging Face, and it builds the serving structure for us. And then it sets up a form. And every time the form is submitted, we go and we run the audio input directly on the serving that we define, right? And this is fine if you're just exploring the model, but if you want to run this in production or deploy this notebook, the issue with this, is that imagine that uh, you have 10 users submitting audio at the same time and the process of converting it to text takes 100 milliseconds. So if you have 10 users, the whole thing is going to take a second, right? But the thing is that tensor technologies that we use to build those models and GPUs, they are really, really good at doing data parallel work which means that instead of processing the audio one by one, we would rather batch all 10 of them together, right? And then uh, do the whole conversion for all 10 of them at once, 
right? And that's and that's not going to take a second. That's going to rather take like 120 milliseconds. So usually that's what we want to do. And in most technologies, when you want to do that, right, if they cannot leverage concurrency properly, it usually means, well, now you need to set up a separate web server. You need to use a different technology where you're going to deploy your serving and you have to figure out how to deploy that model and how you're going to communicate with that server. You have to set everything up. But as we're going to see in Elixir, making this model concurrent so it can batch things, it's like changing three lines of code, right? It's really, really easy. Let's do that, right? So what I'm going to do here is that instead of running the serving directly, I'm going to create a separate process, okay? And a process in Elixir is a lightweight thread of execution. It comes from the Erlang virtual machine, and it basically means that we can spawn like literally like uh, hundreds of thousands of them, right? So I'm going to do Kino star child, and so I'm going to be a process that is a child of the Kino supervision tree. Usually all your applications, so if you're building with Phoenix, it has its supervision tree as well. That's where we would put it. Here we are going to put on Kino, we're going to put it inside Livebooks. So we're going to say, I want to start a NX serving process. And the name of this process, let's say S2T, it can be whatever you want. So that's the name of the process. And also what we want to do is that we want to specify the serving for this process. So it's like, hey, start a serving with this name and you're going to use this serving structure here to serve things. And the other change we're going to do is that we're going to increase the batch size, right? Because one of the reasons we are doing this is exactly because we want to batch things, right? Well, let's do eight, for example, just to get started. So we start with a batch size of eight. Usually you want a power of two. And now the only other thing you need to change is that, well, instead of doing a run, we want to do a batched run on the S2T. So I'm just going to run this thing. It's now going to restart the process. It's going to set up the form again. And if I run it um, on the audio that I had recorded, Hello Darkness, my old friend, we can see that everything works. And that's it. That's how easy we can make it concurrent, right? We change literally three lines of code. One of them was configuration. But it gets even better because what we can do now is that we can also make this distributed. And distributed is a funny word because depending on who you ask, it uh, has different meanings. So if you asked me uh, two years ago, I would say, well, distributed is when you have multiple machines communicating with each other. But if you ask a machine learning engineer, they may say, well, distributed is when you have more than one GPU in your machine and you're using those GPUs, sometimes even communicating across those GPUs. And in order to avoid confusion, NX can do both. We can do both kinds of distributions, and that's what I want to show. So the way I'm going to show it is that I'm going to set up two different notebooks and have them communicate with each other, okay? So let's do that. So I'm going to click here. I'm going to start a new notebook. And what I'm going to do is that I will like literally copy and paste code. I'm going to get this code with the dependencies. Oops. And I'm going to paste here and I'm going to get the code that defines the model, right? And I'm going to paste it here and I'm going to run it, right? So it's going to go, it's going to install the dependencies, it's going to um, start the serving, it's going to compile the serving, it's going to start it and it's running, right? So we have this whole separate notebook running here with the same model. And each notebook is a separate Erlang virtual machine instance. They don't know about each other so far, okay? So I'm going to go back to this notebook and what I'll do is that I'll, I'll just delete this code, okay? And as soon as we delete this code, we don't expect this to work, right? Like this is broken now. So what I'm going to do is, uh, one of the reasons why it's broken is because it doesn't have the feature sampling rate. I know the value here, so I'm just going to hard code it here. I'm going to run it again. This is better now, at least, at least it loads the, the form, I need to record the audio again. Hello darkness, my old friend. And if I run it, it's going to crash because obviously it doesn't know, like it, the serving doesn't exist here anymore, right? So here's what I'm going to do. Here's the cool part, okay? I'm going here, I'm going to get the node name and I'm going to get the node cookie, which is like kind of like a, a password uh, for me to, to talk with this node. So I'm going to uh, copy and paste it. I'm going to go back to this notebook and say, hey, I have a node and a cookie and here are the values. 
and I want to say that the cookie for this node is this, and now I want to connect to said node. So I did this, it returned true, which meant that it was connected. So if I run this again, right, it's going to compile a new form. And if I run it, it works. It, I, it probably struggled a little bit at this end here with my accent, but yeah, it works. It's going to the model, right? And it's, we didn't have to change like a single line of code here, like uh, of our actual code. We didn't change anything. And now an X knows that, hey, you know, I, somebody wants to run a speech to text task, but that thing is in the other node, right? So I have to go and connect to that other node and send the request there, right? So here, like we went from like a simple serving, we made it concurrent, right? And then we made it distributed and all we changed along the way was three lines of code, right? So this is pretty amazing. So um, I one of the reasons I'm like very excited about this is because when we started this whole numerical elixir effort, one of the ideas that we had was like, you know, it's going to be very exciting when we get to a moment where we can leverage this numerical elixir foundation with the powers that we we get from the Erlang virtual machine with concurrency, distribution, fault tolerance. And this is exactly it, right? It shows how easily you can go and change how you want to deploy or run your model without requiring to change a, a big part of the infrastructure or your deployment pipeline and so on. So to give a more practical example, what you can do with this is that like, imagine you're deploying your application on fly that allows you to like, distribute different instances around the world, you have like a bunch of options now. So one option is that you could run, if your machine learning model is small, like you can run it on each machine on the edge, right? You can just have it embedded with, and uh, by making it concurrent, which is what we did, right? So you can do that. But for example, if it gets to a point where you really need, need to batch or you read like, or you need really large models that require a GPU, what you can do now is that you can say, okay, I'm going to do a deployment here um, of those models on the machines with GPU, right? And then instead of having the model alongside like the edge, you can have a cluster that is going to have some GPUs. And what we can do is that if the, those clusters, they have multiple GPUs, we, auto, we will automatically figure that out too. Right? You just need to say, I want those things to be partitioned as well. And it just takes care of everything. So if you have like three machines, each of them with four GPUs, we are going to load balance the request to those machines. We are going to send uh, the batch to whatever GPU becomes available first. And the amount of changes that you need to do, they are very minimal, right? So if you wanted the partition part, right? All you had to do is to say, uh, look, uh, I want it to be partition as well. And then if you have multiple GPUs, that's going to work just as well. So yeah, this is it. Uh, honestly, like uh, this is very exciting. I hope that you have enjoyed uh, this video and what, and I hope it gives ideas of what the different things that you can build uh, on top of this. And just to one last thing, like just to drive this point home is that uh, when we made a next, uh, an X serving distributed, right? The PR was literally 400 lines of code, including tests and documentation. And I think this is like a good testament to, to the platform and how easy it is for us to go from something that was not distributed to completely distributed now running on a cluster. That's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today and see you tomorrow.